in both directions close to the Creevy Tenant Road after a crash. The weather is making it difficult to move the van and the road is impassable now anyway, so the advice is to stay away. Conditions on the A1 remain poor with large sections of the carriageway from Lisburn right down to Newry, down to one lane in each direction. Attempts have been made to clear the A1, but the wind is blowing snow back onto the carriageway. A couple of A-class roads remain impassable this morning near the A25 from Belake to Newton Hamilton and the A29 from Newton Hamilton to Katie. While Transport NI are also warning drivers about large snow drifts at the side of the A50 Catesbridge to Money Slane Road and the A26 Moira to Knott's Corner Road. The good news is there's no major disruption to buses or trains, but that may change as the snow showers arrive. There is no enterprise train service today between Belfast and Dublin. It's expected to resume tomorrow. If you're flying from any of the airports, lots of cancellations again, so check with your airline for updates while all flights are suspended at Dublin Airport until tomorrow. All sailings between Rathlin and Valley Castle have been cancelled for the moment because of the strong winds and all P&O sailings from Dublin have been cancelled for the rest of the day. Elaine Sutherland reporting from the Traffic Control Centre. Travel News on BBC Radio Ulster. The biggest show in the country starts now. So, Bishop John McAreevy dramatically resigns last night after he celebrated a mass alongside priest Malachi Finnegan when he knew he was a paedophile. Finnegan abused at St Coleman's College School in Newry. The Nolan Show is launching a major investigation into historic abuse at that school. Here's our number today. If you've been a victim, if you're a member of the public and you want to react to this incredible story, 03030 80 55 55. On Twitter at Stephen Nolan and on Facebook at Real Stephen Nolan. Good morning. So the bishop is gone. 24 hours after brave victims of paedophile priest Malachi Finnegan appeared on Nolan Live Television, Bishop John McAreevy resigned last night. John McAreevy had known about accusations that Finnegan was a paedophile since 1994, but that didn't stop him from celebrating Mass with the paedophile six years later in 2000. Dr McAreevy claims it was a spur-of-the-moment decision after Finnegan had appeared unexpectedly. Dr McAreevy also officiated at Finnegan's funeral, something for which he has apologised. We will discuss John McAreevy later on this show. We're doing that later because our focus has moved. Remember, this paedophile, Malachi Finnegan, who abused many young children, worked at St Coleman's College in Newry for 20 years. He was the school's president for half of that time. He abused pupils there. And as I've just said at the top of the show, and I need you all to listen to me really carefully, the Nolan Show is announcing today that we are launching a major investigation into what happened historically at St Coleman's College in Newry. Over the past 48 hours, we have been contacted by multiple victims from that school telling us that historic abuse within the school was an open secret. Here's an example from one. But later on, on that particular day, uh, he was also my Latin teacher. He came into the class and immediately pulled me out of my desk and knocked me unconscious, beat me senseless in front of 32 other pupils. He beat you unconscious? Unconscious, yes. That's one of the things that happened within the school. Many people telling us that it was an open secret. So what we're doing today to emphasize what we are doing today is we're reaching out to further victims of the school. We have a number of lines of definite inquiry, of specific inquiry, and we need the community's help. If you were a victim at St. Coleman's College, 
if you were a pupil at St Coleman's College and you notice things happening, we need you to contact us this morning. And here's the email address, nolan at bbc.co.uk. nolan at bbc.co.uk is a secure email. We have a separate team that has now been assigned to this story. And we promise you that your testimony can very much uh, assist us. Now, St Coleman's College uh, in Newry, when we asked the school when they knew about allegations concerning uh, Finnegan, a paedophile priest and a former president of the school, they told us the preceding board received communication at a meeting in February 2014 that the diocese was dealing with an allegation pertaining to Malachy Finnegan. They say the current governors were informed that the claim had been settled by the diocese at their meeting in October 2017. Full stop. So what we did, and you can hear my focus being in St Coleman's now, this is where this story goes. We have gone back to St Coleman's yesterday and we said to them, look, we are hearing from multiple victims telling us that this was an open secret within the school. What's your reaction to that? And do you know what St. Coleman said? They said, we have nothing further to add. Really? Well, let me tell you, I do. I have many questions to add for you, St. Coleman's. Do you not think you've got a duty to investigate? Do, do you not think you've got a, a, a duty on behalf of all of the victims in that school to try to dig into what might have happened within your school in the past? You have nothing further to add. We know it was common knowledge within your school. And what this programme will be doing, if you have nothing further to add, St Coleman's, is we will be reaching out now to the whole community in Northern Ireland and they will add to it. Let me remind you, if you want to contact this show, nolan at bbc.co.uk to give you an example of how common knowledge it was of abuse within this school. Have a listen to this former pupil. My experience would have been every second week, when we were first years, every second week you did PE and then you did swimming. And normally another member of staff would have taken a swimming. But this particular week, uh, Finnegan took us to the swimming pool uh, down in Newry. Um, and after the session, we were in the changing room all getting, uh, you know, ourselves dried uh, before we got our uniforms on and Finnegan was standing in the doorway and next thing he approached me, took my towel off me. Uh, I was completely naked and he started to dry me down uh, quite thoroughly. How, how old were you? I was the first year. I'd have been 11, 12. Uh-huh. And, uh, and you felt that you couldn't say anything to him, obviously, because he's, he's, he's in authority. He's the powerful well, figure. that's exactly it. I mean, who do you go to if the one in authority is the one to do it? You know, and it just, you don't tell anybody. What, just, the, what did it feel like when he did that to you? Well, it didn't feel right. It just felt strange. Uh, at that age, you don't know what happening is this normal because you've only started in this big school this is the head of the school is this the way it is you just don't know any different you don't know any better at that age what year was this 77 he was president at that stage and were there other rumors about him around the school we're trying to establish what yeah. was what was uh, well, what was open was, knowledge around the school and what wasn't? wasn't open knowledge. That was you know that was the running joke that uh, about Finnegan. You know, what was the he, running joke? He'd take you into his office. He'd sit you on his knee, and he'd ask you generally three or four questions. Like he would start off, "Do you drink? Do you smoke? Do you play with yourself? Do you love me?" Th th these are the sort of questions he'd ask you in his office. Did he ask you? He asked me, did I, did I love him? Yes. He did. And did you hear any other 
from any other boys in the school about what he had done to them? I just, I can only speak my own personal experiences with him, but there was that general air that uh, he was just this huge, big, intimidating man that, if at all possible, stay away from do you think it's conceivable that other teachers wouldn't have known or heard the rumours? Well, it was a very close society at that time. You know, there were there were other priests, there were members of the lay staff as well. Who what? So, I mean, there were certain priests in charge of the borders. Um I, I can't say for a fact, but, I mean, it would be pretty impossible not to. Uh, even if they didn't know, they would have heard the rumours from the other students, and if anything, they would have said, would they not have asked? Is any of this true or not? Of Finnegan himself? There are some people trying to tell us that the school didn't know this was going on. Ah, oh, come on. <laughs> right. OK. You really direct how could that be? If was, if the students even at my age, if I was the first year and I knew about it, and it was it was the talk of the, the school right up through the years. What was and the talk of the school? That then again, you just he was inappropriate. That's what he was. You'd either tuck into his office, as I said, and and as somebody else had said before, you you'd be in the study hall, there'd be a member of staff up in the corner, making sure everybody was doing their work. Finnegan would come in, walk around, lean over one particular fella, possibly take him out. And um, that's just the way it was. He took children out of class? Out of the study hall. He would walk in and take them out under what pretense? Sure, You wouldn't know. You'd be putting your head down in case he looked at you. Sure, he didn't have to give a reason. He was president. Teachers were watched as he just was, was taking kids out of the class. Out of the study hall. Yeah. What was the layout in the school in terms of... I'm wondering how Finnegan right. got he, access to the pupils in terms of, you know, if he's sexually abusing them, is he taking them into a room or...? Is, like, well, it's office. I mean... His office was at the top of the stairs. And on the other side of the landing was the study hall. They were directly opposite each other. There was no distance involved. The right was right beside the study hall. Did you ever see the boarding accommodation? Yes. What was it like? How close were the bedrooms of... Well, they were only up a floor. They were up a floor in down a wee corridor. And you had the juniors shared uh, dorms. And then the seniors had their own rooms. But uh, to get to the, the juniors' dorms, you just had to go past Finnegan's office down a wee corridor, and that's, that's where the, the dorms were. So Finnegan was was sleeping close to where the juniors were? Well, his office was there. Do you think the, do you think the Catholic Church are, are being open and, and honest as much as they should be with the public about all of this? No. Definitely not. But how could they be without the whole thing coming down around them? Because they're just sort of looking after their own. What would you say to the Catholic Church? If you want to have a future, you need to come clean. You need to change the way you operate. I think you need to look at letting priests marry have men that are married become priests, have women priests, and um, I think they just need to get with the times. Thank you for talking to me today. Thank you. So within that interview, you, you heard that witness say it was open knowledge within the school that children were being abused and yet in 2018 and just to emphasize the abuse at St Coleman's College Newry is historic abuse there's no indication whatsoever 
that any of this has happened over recent times. None. However, has St Coleman's College Newry not got a responsibility to examine what has happened? To have the confidence of the public, do they not have a responsibility to say, look, here's what we're doing. We're trying to, we're trying to look at, at, to see if we have any information that we could give to the police. What have they actually said? Quote, we have nothing more to add. And I'm repeating myself deliberately. Let me send a very clear message to that school this morning. We will add to it. This programme will add to it, big time. And I'm reaching out again. We have definite lines of inquiry into what happened in that school that have not been revealed yet. And we need your help to build the story. If you were a victim at that school, if you were a pupil at that school and you notice things happening, nolan at bbc.co.uk. Sean Falloon, you would have you will have you will have seen on Nolan Live television. Um, he was a victim. Um, abused at that school. Sean, good morning to you. Good morning, Stephen. I I wasn't abused at the you school. You weren't abused at the school, Sean. My fault. Sorry. Sorry. All right. What 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 is your reaction first of all to what you're hearing this morning? To what I'm hearing this morning, more and more. Um, information coming from other survivors of Finnegan's behaviour um, are coming forward and the, the figure is getting higher. I knew the figure was higher than what I first assumed, but um, I didn't think it would be this high. And um, the people that are coming forward are giving me even more strength, and I'm sure giving other survivors strength to speak out and come forward about it to um, give not just the, the more diocese, but the public in Northern Ireland a clearer picture of what really was going on. I, I, I meant to say you were abused by, by Finnegan, Sean, so I'm, I'm sorry for that earlier. Um, it's OK. But yeah. it, it, it is clear, Sean, that Finnegan abused pupils. We know this for a fact within St Coleman's. Yeah. Um, can it I just... Was also, it was common knowledge out with the school. Because, um, well, the school's response to that, Sean, I just want to tell you this as a victim again. The school's response to this being common knowledge, with nothing further to add. The, the first word that comes to my mind with that is cowardly. Um, they've seen the public response. So um, why not at least say something maybe even just a little feeble, if you like, rather than simply saying with nothing further to add. Um, why not help at least a little, have a little compassion to be clear, for the survivors? To be clear, they have nothing further to add to the statement that they sent in to the BBC, in which they, in which they said the proceeding board received communication at a meeting in February 2014 that the diocese was dealing with an allegation pertaining to Malachy Finnegan, the current governors were informed that the claim had been settled by the diocese at their meeting in October 2017. But you see, it was after that statement I went to that school and I said to that school, we're hearing from multiple victims here saying that this is where the story, this part of the story is at. This was an open secret. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the obvious questions coming from the Nolan Show, if it was an open secret, who knew what within that school? Who chose not to report it to the authorities from within that school? Why did they not uh, report it to the authorities? Because this would have stopped. Had it been reported in a timely manner from within that school, this is where the story goes. Then children, some of them now adults who I have spoken to over recent days, would not have been abused. You have nothing further to add. You have nothing further to add. And if they dealt with it correctly in the first place, in the 80s or even earlier, um, it wouldn't have happened to me when Finnegan was um, out of the school and um, working as a parish priest in Clondoff Parish. And today, 
um, I will be living in Northern Ireland, in my home country. Um, I tell people in Scotland where I live now about how great a place Ireland is as a whole, um, how great a place the more mountains are where, I've, where I originally was, where it's happened. I want to move back home, but I can't. The psychological damage that's been done to me as a result is just too much to deal with. I can come home and visit, but after about a week, my head gets very, very tense, um, like it's getting pushed in, um, because the memories are all around me. Even if, we th- if I travel around roads in Northern Ireland that, where the abuse didn't happen, I- I'm there with it happening to me. I can still feel that man's arm around my neck. I can still feel his hand on my leg, on my private parts. Um, I can still remember the smell, the, the fusty, rosy smell in his hallway. I can't remember the smell of the other rooms for some reason. Um, I, I, I've been telling my mother and other family members in roughly the past 10 years, I've been telling them every year I hope to be moving back home in the next five years. But today, 10 years later, I'm still saying it was only about a month ago, just shortly before the Spotlight program came to our I was saying to my mother, I hope to be home in five years' time. I've been saying that for the past ten years. But uh, the truth is, I'm in a good psychological position at the minute, but the truth is I know that if I move back to Northern Ireland, I will not be able to cope psychologically because it's it's in my face all the time. It's So if these people at St. Cummins College can put themselves in my shoes for two minutes and uh, think about how they would feel about that. Um, Why is the current board of St Coleman's College Newry not saying they are going to look through every piece of information, files, every record they have to see if there's anything that would help the authorities? I'm not saying this is a threat. But um, if they don't, well, hopefully the police ombudsman or public inquiry, if we get one, will identify all that. And I think um, I, 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 given some time, I think at least a teacher from the past in St. Comans will come forward and say, this is what happened, this is what didn't happen yeah, and, and should have happened. And that's what I... this is why... You, Really, it wasn't dealt with, and this is how the teachers felt, and how the teachers were trapped into it. And and that's what I'm appealing for today. Um, if there is if there is a teacher at that school who can help us with our investigation, we have a team sitting down there right now, going through information from victims who contacted us yesterday. I went home last night with with even more knowledge of what happened within that school, with even more victims explaining to me how open the abuse was within that school. Even so I am we this programme is absolutely focused on St Coleman's now. And our email, Nolan at bbc.co.uk. Sean, through your work with BBC Spotlight and Mandy McCauley, you have done um an an incredible service through your bravery for, for this community no in Northern Thank Ireland. You. Like you really the, have the positive is um Many people have been saying to me and giving me strength um, that I'm helping um, other victims and survivors to come forward. But another positive that I see from this is um, potential pedophiles in the future will be hearing about all of us coming forward and not being frightened to speak out and standing up to what happened to them. You see, I... I and whenever they... Sean, um, can I just pick up on one thing there? <clears throat> Sorry, go ahead. You see the way you talk about potential paedophiles in the future? Yes. Um, there might just be some paedophiles who abused in the past who should hear me loud and clear this morning when I tell them we are currently receiving information about you and we're coming after you. Yeah. And we're coming after you to ask you why you did this to children and we're giving the information straight immediately to the authorities. Yep. 
with the potential paedophiles in the future, um, if an adult gets inappropriate thoughts about a child, um, rather than acting on that, will hopefully, through the fear of all of us speaking out, they will go to, for example, their GP and say, I've been having inappropriate thoughts about children, can you help me? So that will help in the future, to some extent, hopefully, um, reduce the possibility of um, future paedophilia. That's another positive that I'm using to continue my strength with uh, speaking out about it. Sean, we're going to be talking about Bishop McAreevy later uh, in the programme yep. uh, because I want to focus on St Coleman's uh, at the start of the show today. Yep. Um, but before you go today, can I get your reaction to the Bishop having stood down? Having resigned? My, my reaction is relief. I'm not happy yet because there are many questions to be answered. Um, some very good questions that you put forward on the Nolan TV show on Wednesday night, and you've, you're, you're continuing to put forward even more questions on the radio shows. Um, so at the minute, it's, it's relief. But I didn't realise that um, my shoulders were quite heavy, and when I got the news yesterday at half past five, m my shoulders went light, and... My, my calf muscles and my legs suddenly got energy. I was just resting yesterday with a relative's dogs and um, hanging about our house, and suddenly my calf muscles got energy in them. I was pacing around the living room, and um, I, yeah, I was relief um, as hitting the nail in the head. Um, it, it was thanks to the Spotlight team and the Nolan Show and BBC Newsline that um, he eventually realised that. His position was untenable. Um, it was time to go, but I, I think he should have went a long time ago. But he has gone step down now, and um, I hope that with any investigations be up in the press or the ombudsman or public inquiry, um, he will help out with those as much as he can. Um, but uh, yes, certainly I am very relieved. And I'm sure the diocese will be relieved as well, not just the survivors of the abuse, because um, there was very little trust in the bishop. And um, with the position that he's in, he needs to have almost 100% trust from his um, from the diocese. And uh, he didn't have that; he's lost it, and uh, it was it was time to go. Sean, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, sir. Thank you. There is a statement that, that has just been sent to the Nolan Show from the Board of Governors of St Coleman's. Um, it reads as follows. The school's scheme of management is that the bishop or his nominee is the chair of the board. The board has not yet been formally notified of Bishop McAreevy's resignation. The board reiterates its previous statement that it condemns in the strongest terms the abuse inflicted by Malachy Finnegan and is devastated that any pupil who was entrusted to the care of St Coleman's College should ever have suffered abuse. The school has already asked anyone affected by the actions of Malachy Finnegan to inform the PSNI, the Diocese, Safeguarding Officer of the school itself. You know, what part of this does the Board of Governors at St Coleman's not get? In terms of my question to you this morning, what are you doing to try to uncover anything within your own school? Have you got information? And the key question from the Nolan Show today is this, and this goes to the current Board of Governors at St Coleman's. Are you prepared to investigate yourselves how this was an open secret? How abuse of children within your school, historic abuse, was openly talked about by many pupils. Are you prepared to use your contacts within the school to establish why someone didn't tell the authorities at the time? And remember, as I'm sitting here right now, today, it is still the position of St Malachy's College in Newry that they don't know 
St, sorry, St. Coleman's, St. Coleman's, my fault, St. Coleman's College, Newry. It is still their position, as I'm sitting here right now, that they do not know. They have, they have no knowledge of why Finnegan, the paedophile, left the school after 30 years. Didn't know. So the public has been told that a teacher that is at a school for 30 years suddenly disappeared from that school and nobody knew why. Nothing motivates me more than trying to bring information uh, about this type of story into the public domain. That's a very clear message to that school this morning. Uh, we're going to take your calls. We're going to speak to the journalist Alison Morris uh, about this. You're going to hear from more uh, victims who were abused at St Coleman's College in Newry, who will tell you this morning this was an open secret. News time, 9.34. Now, the news from the BBC. Thank you, Stephen. Good morning. An amber weather warning remains in place until 10 o'clock this morning as weather conditions continue to impact across Northern Ireland, closing hundreds of schools and hitting travel. Well, as we've been hearing, a victim of a priest who's been accused of abusing 12 people says he welcomes the resignation of the Bishop of Dromore, John McAreevy, after it was revealed he celebrated Mass with the late Father Malachy Finnegan. And the Prime Minister will deliver a major speech today, outlining the relationship the government wants with the EU after Brexit. News and Phil is coming up at 10 o'clock. Uh, Jim and West Belfast. Morning to you, Jim. Good morning, Stephen. Go ahead, Jim. Stephen, I want to make the point. Uh, you had a caller on yesterday. Uh, the first caller of the day, a guy who said that he was in a school in the 70s and he would be in the assembly hall and the Father Finnegan would walk in and the teacher on, on call would sort of put the head down and Father Finnegan would pick a child to come for a special mass. Now, that's a very, very important legal fact from the point of view the police need to go and speak to the speak to that guy, and the information they obtain from that guy go and speak to every teacher in that school at that particular time. Who? Uh, what did they was, know? What did they not know? Well, what were on, they hold, saying? They can provide information to the authorities, surely, to help build a picture. Yeah, Stephen, you let, you, I want to make my point. There's a moral responsibility. If, if I knew there's a child being abused or you knew there's a child being abused, we have a moral obligation for the welfare of that child to pass it on to the appropriate authorities. If this school is saying they didn't know until 2014, you have a plethora of teachers from the 70s and 80s who were well aware because the testimonies that you've had in your show are, are very, very, very direct and very, very uh, frank. There's a moral responsibility for the police to go up to that school today, seize all the files, come back to the 60s, 70s and 80s, and interview every teacher who was teaching at the time. Not, I'm not saying for a second that they had anything to do. What I'm saying is they would have knowledge that could help uh, bring this more to the fore. And if that school, I am disgusted at that school that they have given one line statement to your show. They haven't given one line statement. They've given more, but they have not well, addressed the question they're, they're as to addressed, what they're 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 going to do. They are going to do it, but information within their institution. What they what they have to do They're calling for people to go into the authorities. Do they know do they know anything? Hold on hold on a second. I'm a Catholic, right? And this is the way it is. That school have a if they believe in the doctrine of Catholicism, they have a moral and religious obligation to invite the police in and give them every piece of information possible because okay. that, that guy Sean Falloon, that guy give a have a very articulate testimony. That ch that ch Child at a time, okay. and children like him, Jim, lives have been destroyed. Jim, thank you very much indeed. 0 30 30 80 55 55 to the Irish News is uh, Alison Morris now. Alison, good morning. Good morning. And thank you, thank you for waiting uh, for, for okay. us this morning. Um, I, I am shifting the focus of this story to St Coleman's College, Newry now. Um, 
How, Alison, am I hearing from multiple victims? I sat here yesterday, record. we're going to hear from more of them in a moment, who were saying that the fact that abuse was going on was known throughout the school. How on earth is that pos- possible, Alison? I think that the fact that Bishop McAravey resigned, which is a very unusual thing to happen in canon law, you know, and and for a bishop to take that step shows just how serious this this was and how high up it went. And when you listen to Sean and you listen to victims like that, we know that that kind of abuse, it relies on silence and it relies on power. And the balance of power here lay with the Catholic school and it lay with the Catholic hierarchy and it also lay with those structures that allowed that to happen. Now, if there was past pupils at that school saying it was an open knowledge and they watched children being picked and tapped on the shoulder and taken out of rooms and teachers shuffled and put their heads down, I am sure there are past teachers at that school who are probably quite traumatised and have probably been, been threatened or almost felt fearful into silence over the years of their career as a teacher. But I'm sure that those people could be would be encouraged to come forward and speak now and help put some closure to, to the other victims. Because I, I would imagine we'll see very many more come forward in the days and weeks. Yeah. But also, to go back on something that Sean said, he had said that he hoped the police ombudsman would help look at what the school know and what the school didn't. The police ombudsman wouldn't even have the remit to do that. The police ombudsman investigates the misconduct within the police um, and misconduct if, if something wasn't properly investigated at the time. What is needed at this stage... And I know that this solicitor, Claire McKagan, who's represented many of these victims, have called for that now, is a full inquiry. We did have Sir Anthony Hart's inquiry, which looked at some aspects of the Catholic Church and those institutions. But that was only about children who were in care. That wasn't about children who attended Catholic schools or children who were, as Sean, who were abused while out in the, in the community. And I think that at this point in time, a police investigation, an ombudsman investigation, it's just not going to cut it because, as we've seen, there are victims who are now say, saying that some of the people within the school may have known, that some of the people outside in the community may have known. And I think an inquiry is the only thing that's going to get to the bottom of what was done there. And also, the secrecy in a lot of these cases was because, as you heard in that statement from the school, they said that there had been a settlement. What the church did was then, and we have had this reported before, they pressurised victims and their families into taking compensation payments and apologies but signing confidentiality clauses which meant they couldn't speak. And those people are still gagged to this day. And that's quite shameful. And I think it's, it's shameful on the church and it's shameful to anyone to help facilitate that. And I think that something needs to be looked at to allow those victims the, the freedom to come forward and speak about their existence and not to have been gagged by orders, which, let's face it, for any religious order to be imposed on the victim of abuse is quite immoral. Alison, the, 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 just finally, because I, 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 I know you're going to a meeting, the... That, that that people who were at that school, pu- pupils who were at St. Coleman's in Uri, they 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 have a wealth of information that could that could that could help here. They they will have seen things. They some of them will have experienced abuse themselves. They are they have information that would be vital here to try to bring other people possibly to justice. What would you say to them, Alison, about coming forward? You would hope Primarily to the authorities, by the way, and if they and if they prefer to the media. What would you say to I, them? I think when you hear people like Sean and the strength that he has been given by other people coming forward and speaking to him, there is strength in numbers and there's comfort in numbers. And as you said, they could come forward and speak to the relevant authorities or they could come forward and speak to your solicitor who could also help them access the relevant authorities. Or they could just go and speak to someone they trust who could maybe help them when there's lots of organisations that can do that as well as the media. But I think that if you've heard from Sean today when he spoke, about, it was really touching, he spoke about that lightness coming off his shoulders and the weight being lifted off him. And there's people who are sitting in silence and they're suffering now. And it breaks my heart to think that someone will think that they still, at this point in time, still can't speak out. But they have to remember that they are the victims in this case and they have nothing to be ashamed of. And the fact that Judge, the Bishop McAravey has, has resigned I think is a vindication of those victims and the fact that they weren't protected when they should have been and they weren't given the protection that they should have been as young and vulnerable children. Uh, Alison, thank you very much indeed for uh, your time this morning. Alison Morris from the uh, Irish News. Uh, To remind you again, nolan at bbc.co.uk. That is the one email I want you to remember today. If you were a pupil at St Coleman's and you saw something, and why am I appealing to you to contact us because yesterday, quite frankly, I'll lay my cards on the table. Yesterday, uh, 
I've been contacted by a number of victims. We have recorded their testimony. And it, all of the information is not out there yet. All of the revelations are not out there. And what we're trying to do as a program is we are trying to get that information to you, the public. And to do so, we need your help. We need you to contact us if you were a pupil or a teacher or a victim at that school and you saw something because it will help us corroborate the information. Uh, here are, are some people who have been speaking to us to demonstrate just how open it was that abuse was happening from within St Coleman's. We'll start off with this caller. It was common knowledge in 1981 what Father Finnegan was doing within the school. Common knowledge within the school, is that what you're saying? With, with, within the school, Stephen, and the only blessing that I could see from my point of view was I was a day pupil. Thank goodness I was not a boarder. Because back then, in 1981, Stephen, the boarders only got home every third weekend. So these young boys were at his disposal 24 hours a day for 21 days before they got home on the third Friday. Here's another former pupil at the school. Stephen, I was a pupil there from 1978 to 1985. Uh, during that time, Malagy Finnegan was president for the whole period. Uh, I would safely say that it was the worst kept secret in the college that he was doing something with young boys, at least. Uh, I have to say I wasn't abused by him in that sense. We were slapped and caned, but not sexually abused. But I, in my upper sixth year, boarded for one term from Christmas to Easter. And there was a palpable fear on the face of some of the younger boarders whenever he entered the study hall. My goodness. Are you telling me that as a, as a boy in that school, you knew what Finnegan was up to? Yes. Categorically, yes. Did your friends know? Yes. So is it fair to... to was it widely known within the school that Finnegan was a paedophile? Yes, I would say it was, Stephen, yeah. How sure are you of that? I would put my mortgage on it. Here's more testimony from yet another pupil who has spoken to the Nolan Show telling us abuse within St Coleman's College, Newry was an open secret. Well, basically, I went in 1968 as a boarder and uh, I was fortunate to have an older brother and three cousins who were older than me, who were also boarders. And uh, at the very start, we were given do's and don'ts, but one of the definitely don'ts was do not allow yourself to be caught with Father Malagy Finnegan on your own. And I was only 11 years of age then. I didn't understand what that was about, but I was cognizant of the fact. And uh, shortly... Well, within a couple of months of being at the school, uh, every morning you got up and went to Mass in the chapel. There was the main altar that all the boarders uh, would have attended, but there were side altars. There was about, as I said, about 10 side altars, and as uh, Mass was going on, other priests would come in to say their own private Masses, and they would pick uh, uh, pupils to serve Mass with. And on one occasion, uh, as I was in the, basically attending the main mass, uh, Father Finnegan tapped me on the shoulder to ask me to uh, serve mass with him at one of the side altars. And uh, I refused to do it because uh, at that particular time, I was more afraid of my cousins and my brother than I was of this Father Finnegan. But later on, on that particular day, uh, he was also my Latin teacher. He came into the class and immediately pulled me out of my desk and knocked me unconscious, beat me senseless in front of 32 other pupils. He beat you unconscious? Unconscious, yes. I was Paul, taken out... Paul, just to just hope. You're an 11-year-old child in a school. Well, probably 12 at that stage. You're telling me that a teacher beat you unconscious? Yes. A Catholic priest 
beat you unconscious? Punch me until he knocked me out. In a classroom? And nobody else saw that? Um, you know, it's not my... It's not my job to get angry. Uh, it's just not. But I, I, I think that as all of us, and I am a member of our community, I, 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 I just want us to stand back before we move on here. And I, I want us to envisage the situation within St. Coleman's College, Newry, back then. Where a child has been raped 11 years of age, 12 years of age. And other children are being abused. And there's a sense within the school that something's really wrong. And the pupils are talking about it. And I don't know what the teachers were talking about. And all it would have taken was for some of that information to get to the authorities and it might have stopped another life being ruined. And yet the information didn't go outside of that school. You see, that, I guess, is the most powerful way of me communicating to you why I am determined and this programme is determined to use the resources that you give us, that you pay for through the licence fee, to speak to all of the victims of that school, as many as we can, and to promise you that if you contact us today with information that will help us with our investigation, that we will dig and dig and dig. Uh, if you do have information, if you're a pupil at that school, you were a pupil at that school, you saw something, a teacher at that school. Remember that we have definite lines of inquiry. And I can't tell you what they are because I don't want to lead you. But if you can contact us with information, you may very well be helping us get another story out. Nolan at bbc.co.uk is the email address. Nolan at bbc.co.uk is a secure email address. There's been a, there's been another statement now uh, from St. Coleman's. They're rushing these statements out this morning. And of course, we contacted them yesterday with this question. And that's when we got, we have nothing more to add. Well, now they are adding some stuff as this programme unfolds today. So here's a, another statement sent by their public relations company, uh, the school's public relations company, at 9.41 this morning, 10 minutes ago. Uh... They, 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 they tell the Nolan Show, the school is not an investigative authority, but it is willing to cooperate fully with any inquiry which might take place. Well, again, I would say back to you, St. Coleman's, with, with any inquiry which might take place, might take place, you can't hold an inquiry yourself. You, 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 can't, you can't try to talk to contacts within the school, former pupils, I don't know what, to try to help establish what happened within your institution. The school say with regard to Maliki Finnegan's employment, the decision to reallocate priests at the time, including Maliki Finnegan, rested with the then bishop, Francis Brooks. The bishop of the diocese was responsible for the appointment and removal of the school's president. Uh, Catherine in Banlahinch. Morning, Catherine. Morning, Stephen. Go ahead. Stephen, this is so sad. <laughs> Absolutely sad. Heartbreaking. I'm a mother and my children are off today and yesterday through the snow. And Matt Sellis Sean spoke today about how he's in Scotland and how he misses home. And I take it his mother's still alive when he says he's promising her that he would come home and he just can't do it. And he is the victim. Those children are the victim in all of this. And it's sad that he is 
having to stay away from home because of what someone else has done. My children will come home from school and tell me the most craziest things that have happened through the day. Did none of those children go home and even tell their parents? Did they not say, this happened today, and somebody step up and say, you know, sorry, but that's not right. That should not happen. And if it can happen to someone else's child, it can happen to mine. Mine's there. It can happen to my child. Well, I just don't understand how some people can just either bury their heads in a hole or just I don't know, is it because of it was a church, because of an institute? What? Were they afraid? Did they not want to come out? Did they not want to cause a, a ruckus or, or what? What on earth society do we... You know, I sent my children to school hoping that that's the safest place they can go to, hoping that bullying different things stays away from the door. And yet, sweet Lord... That can go on. I, I just, I'm sorry, I just don't understand it. I don't. And I hope he can come home. He deserves to come home. This is where he was born. This is where he was reared. And he deserves to come home. He is the victim. And I would still call him a child. He was a child when that happened. He was the victim as a child. And no one should ever, ever take that right away from a child. Never. Never. Sorry. <laughs> There's more to come, Catherine. I hope so. There's I more. hope so. It's a dark, dark day when when we can hold our heads, I don't know, and, and listen to the like of this, and yet what was it that didn't drive some of those people to go and tell? Was it shame? Was it embarrassment? Was it, I don't know, did they not want to cause a ruckus? Did they not want to say that this was going on? The only way I would look at it is if, if I thought I was sending my children there day in, day out, if that could happen to someone else, that, that could happen to my child. You know, sh- surely as a parent, school's meant to be the safest place. That's where a, a child's only a child for so long. Never put a, an old head in young shoulders and a child's only a child for so long. It deserves to be a child. Catherine, thank you. Uh, Dermot Nangle, good morning to you, Dermot. Morning, Stephen. You were a day pupil at St Coleman's. Yes. Um, I, I I know you're on the the TV show on uh, No Live on Wednesday night. Um, thank you for talking to us again. So what I'm trying to understand, Dermot, I I walked out of here. I genuinely walked out of work last night stunned. Okay, confused in my mind, because I had recorded a number of interviews with with victims at that school, and they were all saying saying the same thing to me that it was widely known within the school. And I sat I sat in the car last night and I thought, what was happening within that, that, that building? That the destruction of children was widely known and it was kept within that building. Dermot? Yeah, well, that was kind of symptomatic of the time, I guess. Um, uh, all the closed shop, uh, secrets, um, what they were saying about the teacher in the study hall would just put their head down and not react whenever Finnegan would walk in and pick me out. Um, it was it was just par for the day, all that abuse. I mean, you're going to reveal the stories later, the amount of what went on. It, it, it was no surprise to me, all the stories I heard. The guy was beaten unconscious. You know, I got a beating from Finnegan as well. Um, yeah, let's get it all out. I'm shocked by the school. Again, you know, it's it's it's. Can I just ask you for the record? You were day pupils in Coleman's. Yes. Do you believe it was widely known within that school? I believe that I believe the uh, teaching establishment would have known. There's no way they would have not known that. That's now. I, I personally, I mean, the guys have come on and said about. Oh, don't get caught with Finnegan. I, I, I never heard about that. I genuinely thought right up until recently I was the only pupil who had who'd been abused or, or, or targeted. But I cannot believe that the teaching establishment did not know what was going on. Well, obviously there were good teachers at that school. There were teachers at that school who did not know. 
But my God, if any adult, I don't understand how any adult could know about child abuse and not report it. I just don't. Well, as I said, it was, it was part of the day. It was all... It was, uh, I just it was, wish you would stop saying that. It was part of the day. Well, it was, wasn't it, Stephen? I mean, you're going to get all the guys who've been on telling their stories. Abuse was part of a school day. It, yeah, yeah. The physical abuse was certainly... That was a daily occurrence. Uh, and, and the sexual abuse went on in the background. And that, that was the way it was in those days. You'll get most of the people in this country will say that. Um... Uh, and we've got the other institutions that are currently being investigated. It wasn't just the, the, the Catholic schools. Um, so, yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things as well was, I remember the guys were saying, in first year, I got a beating by Finnegan. By the time I got to first year, I, I already knew how to take a beat from primary school. So that, that's how prevalent it was, really. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm repeating it again. There's currently uh, a separate Nolan team waiting for you right now if you have information about what went on within St Coleman's College. Please trust us. Nolan at bbc.co.uk if you send your contact details to that email. Did you see anything? And we're currently working up definite lines of inquiry, which we hope to be able to bring you uh, within the next few weeks. There's a major investigation going on, and let me tell you, it is needed. Now, at 10 o'clock, the news from the BBC. Show. On 92 to 95 FM and 1341 medium wave, this is BBC Radio Ulster. And with the BBC News at 10 o'clock, I'm Tina Campbell. Snow has closed almost 400 schools with large parts of counties Down, Armagh and the southern part of County Antrim experiencing significant snowfall overnight. Thousands of people in the Republic have been experiencing power cuts because of the heavy snow and high winds associated with Storm Emma. The authorities have lifted a warning for people to stay indoors but they're being encouraged to stay off the roads. A victim of the paedophile priest, Father Malachy Finnegan, has said he's relieved that Bishop McAreevy has resigned. The Bishop of Dromore announced he was stepping down yesterday after facing criticism over celebrating Mass with Father Finnegan. Sean Falloon says there must now be a full investigation and called on the Catholic Church to cooperate. More and more um, information coming from other survivors of Finnegan's behaviour um, are coming forward and the, the figure is getting higher. I knew the figure was higher than what I first assumed, but um, I didn't think it would be this high. Theresa May is to set out her view of the future relationship the government wants to have with the EU after Brexit today. Conservative MP Chris Grayling says the Prime Minister will set out ways to deal with Brexit which do not undermine the integrity of the Union of the United Kingdom. Well, we have already made uh, proposals about this. The Prime Minister will talk more about that today. But I think we have to be clear, the United Kingdom does not intend, will not put a hard border uh, between the Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. We say, see no need for it. Uh, we put forward proposals about how that can be made to operate. The Prime Minister will talk more about that today. That was the news on to Sport Now with Nigel Ringland. Head coach John O'Gibbs will leave Ulster Rugby at the end of the season to return to New Zealand. In a statement released in the last half hour, Gibbs says it's for family reasons. The 41-year-old had signed a two-year deal before joining up with Ulster last summer. Pep Guardiola says he can't deny that the Premier League title is now in Manchester City's hands. They're five wins away from being crown champions with 10 games left after last night's 3-0 win at Arsenal. And Northern Ireland's top sprinter Amy Foster will be in action shortly in the heats of the 60 metres at the World Indoor Championships in Birmingham. Thank you, Nigel. Now finally on to that all-important weather forecast with Angie Phillips. 
A yellow bee aware warning for snow remains in place today with further snow showers affecting many parts on and off throughout the day. Strong gusty winds will lead to drifting of lying snow and many blizzard conditions are likely in snow showers as well. Highs only reaching 2 or 3 Celsius but feeling well below freezing due to the wind chill. Still windy with snow showers in places tonight and becoming icy, especially over lying snow as temperatures dip below freezing. BBC News. BBC Radio Ulster. Travel News. Well, that weather continues to cause disruption on the roads, mainly in the south and east of the country. The B7 Money Slane to Dramara Road is now passable with care, but drifting snow may cause conditions to change quickly. A number of B and C class roads remain impassable, including the B132 Middletown to Kitty Road, the B27 at Spelga, the B78 Newton Hamilton to Market Hill Road, the B25 Catesbridge to Waringsford Road, the B3 Lock Brickland to Rutherford. Fryland Road, the Front Road in Drumbo and the Black Skull to Dunny Cluny Road. While in County Tyrone, the B80 Tempo to Fenton Road is only just passable, so avoid it if you can. Two A-class roads remain impassable this morning. They're the A25 from Balik to Newton Hamilton and the A29 from Newton Hamilton to Katie. A van is blocking part of the Macronock Road in both directions, close to the Creevy Tennant Road after a crash earlier this morning. That road is also now impassable, so the advice is to stay away. Conditions on the A1 remain very poor, with large sections off the carriageway from Lisburn right down to Newry, down to one lane in each direction. The good news is, though, there's no major disruption to buses or trains at the moment. That may change as the snow showers arrive. There is no Enterprise train service today, though, between Belfast and Dublin. It's expected to resume tomorrow. If you're flying from any of the airports here, lots of cancellations again today, so check with your airline for updates. While all flights at Dublin Airport are suspended until tomorrow. All sailings between Rathlin and Ballycastle have been cancelled because of strong winds. There will be an update on that in around an hour's time. And all P&O sailings from Dublin have also been cancelled for today. Elaine Sutherland reporting from the Traffic Control Centre. Travel News on BBC Radio Ulster. Right, we're going to continue to, to take your, your calls about uh, the abuse uh, from... Uh, Father Malachy uh, Finnegan, uh, a paedophile who is now dead. Uh, your reaction, 0 30 30 80 55 55. After Linda McCauley tells us what's on your, on your behalf tomorrow morning. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, last Saturday we started talking about how things are meant to last. The view was that they're, they're not built the way they used to be. And we heard from listeners with all sorts of appliances, from a 41-year-old washing machine and a 45-year-old tumble dryer, a 54-year-old mixer, we had two 41-year-old cookers. At the winner on Saturday was a 66-year-old kettle. But then we heard of a 78-year-old appliance that's still working. And uh, You can have a look on the website, you can have a look on Facebook and see what you actually think it is. We get lots of guesses on that. But it sort of started us thinking what happens when you send an old cooker, or tumble dryer or washing machine to the council recycling plant. Well, I've been to Refresh in Newton Arts and I can tell you as part of a housing executive grant scheme to create employment and re-energise, I know where your old cooker is now and it's looking great. So we're talking about that. We're talking about oil deliveries through the house if you live in a mid-terrace house. For 20 years, Patrick didn't have to pay extra for the hose to go through the front and out the back. Then he had to pay £10 delivery. Now it's 20 Is that happening to you? Are you paying extra? And talking of oil, keeping warm and saving energy, do you keep the heat on all the time or set a timer? We'll have an answer to that burning question. So join me tomorrow morning. I hope you will stay warm, 9.45 till 10.30, on your behalf. Linda, thank you very much uh, I- I- indeed. Listen, there's so much information coming into us uh, this morning. Thank you for doing so. 030 if you want to pick up the phone to us today. Uh, nolan at bbc.co.uk is the secure email if you want to send us your contact details if you can help us with this story what went on with Vincent St Coleman's College Newry historic abuse what did you see what did people know nolan at bbc.co.uk or uh, 030 30 80 55 um, 55 this story is dominating our coverage today um Bishop John McAreevy um, has resigned, as as you know, as a bishop. Just just to tell you another thing that we're looking into separately about Bishop John McAreevy, we noticed that on the CCMS own website, 
Uh, we notice that Bishop John McAreevey is on the board of trustees for that organisation. So that's the Council for Catholic Maintained Schools. Bishop John McAreevey is still listed on their website as being on the board of trustees for that organisation. Um, this programme is inquiring as to whether the board feels that Bishop John McAreevey is still suitable to be on the board of trustees for that organisation. Um, we have been in touch asking for a press officer to contact us urgently and so far we have had no response. Right, to your calls now, 03030 80 55 55, 03030 80 55 uh, 55. Uh, Bartley, morning Bartley. Morning Stephen. Go ahead. Stephen, Bartley. first thing before we start out, first thing to uh, Mr. Fallon, Sean, people, your heart goes out to them, that's the first thing. For these evil, evil, evil beasts, they're not priests, I'm talking about Brenton Smith and all them. But see, the the, 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 I, the people have to get it's another thing in the head. It's because at the minute it's, it's coming across to me, the story is very, very strong story about Catholic priests and Catholic that A paedophile can be a grandfather, a father, a brother, the man next door. It's not just the priest. The priest can be named because of no siblings. But there's, there's, the, the, these paedophiles are in our community. The police are a dedicated uh, uh, teams in each uh, station to deal with all these paedophiles. So the thing about that is in a Catholic priest, there's very, very good Catholic priests throughout the length and breadth of Ireland who are being physically abused and spat upon because of people have this perception that priests are all paedophiles, which is not the case. The priests have to work within canon law as well. And there's different things they, that they have to do. But we have Brenton Smith and Mr Finnegan. And I think the bishop has been has been the bishop has, has resigned. And just before we come on there, he's in what the board of trustees. I think the bishop has suffered enough. What he's done, he made mistakes, he made bad judgments, but he made them with the help of other people. But I, I think a witch hunt of, of, of punishing that priest for the evil that 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 priest has done, who is now dead. And I would Finnegan, you're talking about Finnegan for the evil that Finnegan did. Yeah. And I would implore anybody listening to this show now, please don't wait any longer. Go to your family. Go to the police. Go to anybody you trust. And tell if you've been abused, don't wait for 10 or 20 years these people die or go away. Do it today. Go to whoever you can because they're... they're Stephen, a paedophile can be anybody, your next door neighbour. Look what happened to all the children in Australia. It was in the news in England yesterday. Thousands of children were abused. We need to stop it. We need to stop it now. And everybody's listening. If you've been abused, go to your family. Go to somebody. Please go and tell. Don't let these people get off with it. But the, uh, my, my bit is this morning, it's not just Catholic priests. We have about 25 uh, bad, evil beasts, I would call them. And they have, they're taking down a lot of good, decent, very good men in our community, priests, and very good people. I went through a dark time from September to December this year. And I only for a very local priest who helped me through it. I mean, Stephen, was, uh, my heart goes out to some of the priests. If you know what's going on behind the... I know a priest who walks down the street, he was actually spat on. He couldn't even stop. He had to walk on. It's terrible that that happens. And I and, and, and Mr. Deshaun Falloon and all, for them people what they went through is dreadful thing. A dreadful thing. But these evil people must be, they must be punished. Don't let them die. Let these people come forward now and get their names and let the law deal with them. Okay. But please don't punish every priest in the community. They're all good. They're, they're very good men there. And some of them have made bad decisions, bad things. Partly, thank you. Within, work within canon law. Partly, thank you very much uh, indeed. 03030 80 55. Uh, 55. Um, back to St. Coleman's College, Newry. The historic abuse that went on within that school. Who knew what was going on? Tony. Morning to you, Tony. Morning. You were, you were a pupil at St. Coleman's. I was indeed, yeah. What would you like to say, Tony? Oh, well, that man was definitely known about by every pupil in the school. Um, if you were sent the office to get chalk or whatever. This is Finnegan you're so, talking about. Yeah, talking about Finnegan, you would have skirted. Um, you know, you'd look around the corner to make sure he wasn't there because he'd have taken you up to a room um, and anything could have happened uh, in that room. So it was like, yeah, but I, I I, was lucky. I, I just never got caught. So maybe I was too ugly or something, but um, that's a joke. But uh, um, it was very, very difficult for, for me like you, you just worried about 
people like that all the time in that school and it was you know a lot of beatings not just from him but from others that was so tony were you uh, were, were were you and your friends at that school the other pupils at that school were you aware that that finnegan was engaged in physical abuse of children or sexual abuse or both uh, both and how were you aware that he was involved in sexual abuse of children well, you would have known that to stay away from them and people, like, no one would have admitted that stuff happened to them because of just because of being embarrassed. But um, we knew, like, everybody knew he just steered clear of that man. That man was dangerous. Um, was it talked about among the pupils? Yeah, but, you know, like, when you're puberty that age, you're just scared of, you know, becoming a victim of bullying or whatever in the school, so... If anything happened, he would have said nothing. So, like in a, an all boys school, bullying would have been fairly endemic. So, you got flagged for being, you know, a priest boy or, you know, bitch or something like that. You know, that would, that's what your big fear would have been, but you would have said nothing. Tony, and are you why. are you in any doubt that children being abused in that school was known wide and a widespread nature? That it was common, that it was common knowledge? Are you in any doubt? It was common knowledge that that particular person was dangerous, yes, Finnegan was a dangerous person. So if it was common knowledge, Tony, is it conceivable in your view that at least some adults at that school would have known? Yes. Like what the... the Don't mention any names. Very important, you do not mention any names here. Okay, well, whenever we were there, um, Finnegan became became the president. So he was handed that job by previous president who became Bishop, let's not mention him. Bishop name. Brooks, he's dead now. Yeah, yeah, but like, surely he has had to know what you know, the, the, the stories around that school, has to know, like has to know There's, I don't know how you wouldn't know and like others, the vice president um, priests that were inside that school that probably didn't do anything but um, should have known but it was, if you, if you want yeah, to... We do, we do not know, because we need to deal with facts. Yeah. We, we do not but know... But if you were 14... Hold on, Tony, 14, let me say this. It's important yeah, I say this. And this is why I'm asking, I'm appealing for people to come to the Nolan Show with information. Uh, we do not know that any other priest knew. But but what we, yeah. are, what, what we are getting is we're getting a very clear picture being built up from people contacting us privately that abuse... It was talked about within the school. It was talked yeah. about in so far as people knew that Finnegan was an abuser. Yeah, well, I, you would have known it. You wouldn't have met if you were abused. I, I luckily wasn't abused, as I said, and I'm not making that up. I have no reason. You know, I would say it if I, if I was, but um, you were you knew from the chatter um, that you just steer clear of that guy because that would have been... You know, if he got you up into his office, especially when he became president, if he could get you up into his office, he'd ask you if you smoked, if you drank, and if you fled with yourself, and that was his cue to get to get close with you. And that whole mass thing, so they had a private church, and he was all there always would have been looking altar boys, and I just never did an, an altar thing in the night. It was, um, so Tony, thank you so much for contacting us. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, sir. We 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 have some breaking news this morning. Um, it is that the uh, public protection branch of the PSNI have been in touch with the Nolan Show uh, to tell us that the PSNI has now set up a dedicated team to investigate complaints of clerical and institutional abuse involving Father Malachy Finnegan. So to repeat, the PSNI telling the Nolan Show within the last few minutes that the PSNI has now set up a dedicated team to investigate complaints of clerical and institutional abuse involving Father Malachy uh, Finnegan. Um, more information to you, because we, we asked the police if there is a legal obligation in their view for the church to report a paedophile. So we specifically asked this question, was there a legal obligation for the Catholic Church to report 
paedophile priest Malachi Finnegan when they first became aware of him abusing children in 1994. And we further asked, was there a legal obligation for the church to report paedophile priest Malachi Finnegan before they eventually reported him in 2006? So the PSNI have responded in the following manner. They have said, based on the information that we have available to us at the time, at this time, our inter interpretation is that there is a legal obligation under Section 5 of the Criminal Law Act, Northern Ireland, 1967, that anyone who has information about a serious crime should bring it to the attention of the police. So the PSNI telling the Nolan Show this morning that they believe there is a legal obligation under the Criminal Law Act of 1967, Section 5 of it, for anyone who has information about it, a serious crime to bring it to the attention of the police. And then we asked this question. We said, will the PSNI be opening up any type of investigation into why their records are showing, this is their computer records, that the first report from the Catholic Church into the paedophile priest Malachi Finnegan was in 2006, when there is evidence now that the church knew Finnegan was a paedophile in 19. At 94. And the police responded as follows. They said, from what we now from what we know today, and from inquiries made in respect of computer systems and files, the only report that we have been able to find from the Catholic Church is in 2006. However, and this is important so that we're totally fair to the Catholic Church, the police say, I need to make it really clear that this team will carry out further extensive manual trawls of all records in order to ascertain if there were any previous reports made by the Catholic Church prior to 2006. This will be a long and protracted process, but will be conducted as expeditiously as possible. So essentially the police saying, from what we know today, so they have no information from what they know today, essentially the police are saying that the Catholic Church did report this before 2006. They then say, am from their computer files. They can't find anything on the computer files that it was reported before 2006, but they are going to do further extensive manual trawls of all records in, in order to see if there um, were any previous reports made by the Catholic Church prior to 2006. Remember, that the Catholic Church, and I'm paraphrasing now because I do not have this in front of me, uh, the exact words, um, but the Catholic Church in, in their statements to the Nolan Show uh, and indeed to BBC Spotlight are saying that they, they, they saw uh, that Bishop Brooks at the time, this is back in the, the 1990s, um, had, had sought a legal opinion um, as to whether he was required to, to report uh, the Finnegan abuse to the church. Uh, but the Catholic Church said, look, they thought it had been reported, but they did not have absolute evidence that it definitely had been reported. So that's where all of that's uh, at. There is more breaking news uh, uh, this, this morning. Um, the Council for Catholic Maintained Schools have been in touch with the Nolan Show to say, as a consequence of the resignation of Bishop John Macarevi, he automatically vacates his role as chairman and council member of the Catholic Council of Maintained Schools with immediate effect. So Mr. McAreevey is gone now from his role as chairman and council member of the CCMS with immediate effect. Right, uh... Let's just pause for a second, remind you of the number 03030 80 55 55. In a new series for BBC Northern Ireland, Barra Best travels the length of our coastline, meeting those people for whom the sea plays an important role. I'm going to get a perspective few tourists would ever see. It's amazing to be outside in the fresh air. Where else would you want to be? You don't want to be in an office. Keeps you young, keeps you invigorated, and you're as happy as anything. This is just such an amazing part of the world, Bora. Absolutely breathtaking. Coast Lives starts tonight at 7.30 on BBC One Northern Ireland. We're going to move on. 
uh, towards the end of the, the show today. Let, let, let's move on. Once hailed as the next George Best, he was the youngest player at 16 to play for uh, Newcastle United's first team. But a freak training ground injury ended what everyone believed would be a glittering career as a professional footballer for Lisburn man Paul Ferris. In his new book, Boy in the Shed, Paul tells of the sectarian intimidation suffered by his family when he was growing up, his heart attack, his brother's dark moods, and, of course, a promising sporting career that was cut short. And Paul is with us now. Paul, good morning to you. Morning, Stephen. Good morning, Paul. Nice, nice to talk to you today. Um, and you? Why are you the boy in the shed? The boy in the shed, I actually... Um, my mother suffered a heart attack when I was five years old and I slept next to her and I wasn't aware that she had a heart attack, but I, I knew something was badly wrong when she came out of hospital and she was a little bit less than she was. So she would send me out to play when I was about five or six and I would, instead of going to play with my friends, I would climb in the old coal shed behind the house and <laughs> I would have a look in through the window because I, I, I kind of thought if I was watching over her, then she, she, couldn't, she couldn't leave me because she tried to leave me before. And, and the story really was, was me reflecting on my own heart attack at 48, thinking about that boy that I'd forgotten. Um, and really just that boy's journey from having that relationship with his mother that was, was one based on a deep love but also that fragility that that love might disappear at any point and then obviously growing up in Ireland at a time you know that was the, when the country was in, in turmoil and then as you just mentioned before going off to play for Newcastle before doing other things which included sort of going off to be a physiotherapist and a, and a barrister and then going back into football again. So your, your mother, your father, your brother died of a heart attack a condition, correct? Yes, and I and I and they did. And you've had a heart attack at forty eight. I had a heart attack at forty eight, and then had subsequent tests that show that I have a I have an inability to carry cholesterol like you would. So so um, I have three boys now, and so so they, they've been tested as well, and they suffer that they have the same sort of condition that's there. But but so basically, basically that scary, just, Paul? very scary. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a scary place to be. But they the, what they've told me and. What I talk about in the book is almost saying that I have better tools to fight my condition than my mother did. She didn't have the information that I have to hand and didn't have the knowledge that I have. And so I think if I can control my diet and exercise, I can't change the condition, but I can, I can, I can stop my arteries from filling up. How do you do that? Diet? Not, 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 yeah, not, eat, not eating, not eating cholesterol at all. So I basically, I, I, I was on. I think anyone who's listening who's had a heart attack would know that you, you come out of hospital as, a, as a changed person and you, you have a. A bag full of medication and I never took medication before because I was always a reasonably fit person so I've basically spent the last three or four years determined to get off those medications and I'm, I'm pleased to say I'm off the vast majority of them now I take a very small dose of a statin and I, and I exercise and run and I'm a bit more of a boring person than I used to be but but I'm but I'm, I'm still here for my family and that's the most important thing we, we, we've got about five minutes left unfortunately just given the other the, the other news we're talking today and I, I would encourage people to read your book there's a lot in it um, what did it What did it feel like when your when your football career is over? Because I've often wondered for a for a footballer, you know, all of that adrenaline, all of that buzz, it must be incredibly enjoyable at the time, but incredibly painful when it ends. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I describe in the book. Even if I mean, I only ever scored one goal for the first team, but it was in the, you know, it's in James's Park at the Gallagher end, which is a dream, and I, I describe the feeling of that. I think hopefully I describe it well for people that, that it's just like a. And electricity that goes through your body that it's hard to describe. So so you kind of want that again and again. You describe it as adrenaline. You want that rush again and again. And I kind of knew my career was finishing and it was drifting away. And it was very painful to take. And, and unfortunately, I had that fear of my mother passing away the whole time. And, and just at the moment when my football career did finish, unfortunately, my mother did my mother did pass away at that time. So that was a that was a lonely painful. place. That was a, a dark. I, I think for the first time in my life, that was the first time I felt just abject, abject, just loneliness and devastation. And it took me months and maybe a year to try and almost find my feet again and walk into a college and say I want to move on. Does the football world rally round you when it's over? Uh, no, no. I'd have to say, in, in, at that particular time, no. It, it, it just it was it, to be blunt about it. No, it didn't. It, it was a, it was a one minute you were there and the next minute you were gone. See, that's scary, isn't it? All those relationships and friends and structure around you gone. Yeah, and I think some of that comes from from your own your own hurt pride as well. I think there'd be people there that were your friends that would probably would have helped. But I think I think when it finishes, I think in my case certainly, I, I my personality was such that I kind of just wanted to go away and and try and try and better myself and come back again, come back again, maybe bigger and stronger, hopefully. How do you start all over again? That that that, that takes guts. 
to go into something completely different in middle age? Yeah, I, well, I did it. I've done it a couple of times now, and I just think I don't know. There's certain points in life. I just uh, I always say to my kids sometimes, if you, if, if you know, if you're not happy where you are, or if you, if you if you feel like there's something more, then there's no point in looking around and, and thinking the world's dealt you a poor hand. You you, you got to just go and go and, and and use the best you've got and try and try and do the best you try and do the best you can. Is what I've always tried to do. A barrister. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean that. I, I actually I actually as a physio at the football club, I, I trained. I, I converted the law. I've got a very understanding <laughs> understanding mm-hmm. wife who let me sell let me sell half of our home and, and go to bar school when I was forty two. And actually, uh, very quickly after I qualified as a barrister, I actually was practicing uh, my pupillage in Leeds and, and got a phone call from Alan Shearer to say I'm I'm going back into football and I'm, I'm I want you to come with me. And and I was tempted again and I went with him again. And unfortunately, that didn't turn out so well for us. Yeah. But, but you you must have a, a be proud of your inner strength to be able to you know. Serious uh, health conditions. Um, to, to to become a barrister in middle age, I think is incredible. You must have a, a a very strong personal drive within you. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not. I'm not sure what. To be honest, I'm not sure what it is. I actually, I actually try to think about the book itself and and why why I sit down and write it. And I almost think the barrister thing and all the things that I've tried to achieve in my life, I almost think it's like going back, uh, it's almost a letter to my mother to say, I'm okay, I, I did okay in the end, even though she's not here to see it. I, I, I said a matter of moments ago, I wish I had more time to talk to you, sir, I really do, but I guess that's a, an encouragement for people to, to read um, about your story. It's an incredible story in your book. Your new book is called Boy in the Shed. Paul, thank you very much indeed. Sorry this has been brief. Thank, thank you, Thank you, sir. Stephen, thank you. Good morning. BBC Radio Ulster. With Sean Coyle. Good morning, good morning. Sunbeams will soon smile through. Good morning, good morning to you.